Tom Wood Show, episode 1741. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Just yesterday, that is, I guess that would be September 23rd, 2020, at a White House press conference, Dr. Scott Atlas was speaking and told the reporters assembled there that they should, if they want to know what they're talking about, listen to certain epidemiologists. And he listed some names that may be familiar to listeners of this program. And one of them was our guest today, Martin Koldorf of Harvard Medical School. So it's quite timely, this particular episode. Professor Koldorf is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's a biostatistician and epidemiologist whose research centers on the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks. And he's been doing some very important writing and speaking lately. And I want to get him on here to ask some of the questions that we really are seeking answers to, for which the answers forthcoming have often been contradictory or opaque. I want to say also that on Monday, I do this program every weekday, but on Monday, episode 1743, you'll definitely want to listen for that also because I'll be having a related conversation with a young fellow named Gret Glyer, who at age 26, four years ago, created the extraordinary philanthropy app DonorC, D-O-N-O-R-S-E-E. And the idea behind that app is that donors can help with little micro projects. They can help a particular person, let's say, hear again or see again, or they can build a house for a widow by their contributions. And then the donor can see the results. They get a video of the person, let's say, who gets sight seeing for the first time, or they get a video of somebody walking you through the house that your money helped to build in some developing country. They don't have to be in developing countries, but a lot of these projects are. And Gret, who lived in Malawi, which at that time was the poorest country on earth for three years, is coming on to talk about the effects of lockdowns on the developing world. And it's a story that's just not being told because these lives are just not politically interesting to people right now, but they sure are on this program. So make sure you subscribe to the Tom Woods Show, tomwoods.com slash Apple. All right, now for our conversation today. Martin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tom. I was delighted to see your interview in Jacobin Magazine, which I've been familiar with for quite some time. And I think it's a, an important step in trying, probably in vain, unfortunately, to depoliticize the discussion of the virus and the lockdowns. I guess maybe I'm naive, but I was shocked at how quickly this issue became politicized. There's no reason for it. Not only is there no reason for it, it shocks me further that there are people who do think of themselves as being on the left who really will not admit any dissent on the subject of the lockdowns, even though it does seem to hit vulnerable people disproportionately uh, uh, hard. So I was very glad to hear your voice, and I know that you are trying to to be nonpartisan in this, which is very, very important. Uh, it, we c- just can't afford to let partisan bickering get in the way of sensible public policy in this matter. So my first remark to you is thank you for that. Um, I agree what you said. I think it's very surprising that it's become so political. It's a, it's a public health issue, and we share the joys of life, but we also share the viruses. So uh, it's something that we have to deal with together, all of us. That's right. That's right. So let me start with a question that's been bothering me. Some people who oppose lockdowns have been saying something like this. If you lock people down, Eventually, when inevitably you have to let them resume some form of normal life again, they're just going to encounter the virus once again. The virus will be, as they say, out there waiting for them. But my question for you is, suppose we had the most relentless, inhumane, monomaniacal lockdown imaginable, and our only public health goal was fighting the virus. Nothing else mattered. Is it conceivable that you could suppress a virus, not just flatten the curve, but actually move on to full suppression if you had a long and tough enough lockdown? If you had a very, very strict lockdown, then uh, probably it's possible to suppress it. But as soon as you lift the lockdown, it will come back. So even then, so even then, no matter how inhumane you are, you still will have to reckon with it at some point. Yeah, because I mean... Uh, the only alternative would be complete eradication, but that's not going to happen with COVID. Uh, there are only the two diseases uh, 
in world history that has been eradicated. One was smallpox, the other one was rinderpest, and both were done with vaccines. So um, uh, already, this is going to be endemic. It will be with us for a long time, but right now we are in the pandemic phase, which is uh, not so nice, it's terrible. But eventually it will be a sort of uh, much milder and uh, most people are going to get it when they are young as a child and without any major consequences. Well, that leads me to my next question. You have favored, along with uh, many of your colleagues, an age-specific kind of approach to how to handle this, given that we had no right to expect that the virus would, the, the people who would be vulnerable to it, would be so heterogeneously distributed so, so that it's the older folks who, in particular, tend to be the most vulnerable. And you would think the public policy response would take that into account. But the response to that has been, yes, it's true that younger people are not really very much at risk of dying from this. The problem is, if you go let them lead their lives, then they're going to bring it home to their grandmothers, and that's going to be the problem. So what's been your response to that concern? Uh, live their life, but don't visit grandmother. But... Uh to, to take it more seriously, with COVID, there's a more than thousandfold difference in risk between the oldest and the youngest. So among the old people, uh, this is much worse than annual flu, but among children, it's much milder than the annual influenza. So we really have to use that feature of the COVID uh, to, uh, to beat it. And what happens is sooner or later, we're gonna reach herd immunity. That's not a strategy. It's what every pandemic or epidemic will eventually, of this type will eventually lead to, uh, either through a vaccine or through natural immunity or a combination of the two. So we will eventually reach there. And the question is then, how do we minimize the deaths until we get there? Well, we do that by protecting the elderly. So let, let, we don't know what, what uh, percent is needed for herd immunity. But among that percent, let's say it's 40%. If there are a lot of old people in that 40%, then we can have a lot of mortality, a lot of death, because they are much more higher mortality if they get infected. But if it's mostly young people in, in this 40%, then we can have very few deaths. So the key to minimize the, the mortality from, uh, from COVID-19 is to uh, protect, the, number one, is to protect the elderly. Uh, in various ways. Some of them are easy to do and some of them are hard to do, but we have to do them if we want to uh, minimize mortality. While we let younger people live uh, fairly normal lives, uh, they should still take uh, general precautions like washing hands and uh, making not shaking hands and so on. But uh, we should let them live uh, uh, more or less normal lives until then we reach herd immunity and then the older people can also resume their normal lives. I guess based on your comments that you consider the question to be still open, which it clearly is because of the debate on it, but do you have any sympathies in the discussion about uh, exactly what it would take to reach herd immunity in this case? Because we're, we're hearing figures as high as 60%. And then there's a, there's a minority school that says it seems like something appears to happen as low as 15 to 20%. And then we've got discussion of T-cell immune responses. And I read one doctor saying that maybe the T-cell protection that people have is heterogeneously distributed around the world, which helps to account for why some places seem to do better than others. Do you come down on this anywhere? Yeah, so I'm not an expert in immunology, but uh, antibodies will just give you the lower, lower bound on the number of people who have immunity because, as you say, there's also T-cell immunity, and a study in, uh, in Sweden showed that the number of people with T-cell immunity was just as big as the number of people with antibodies. Uh, and then there might be innate immunity also and cross immunity. So I think no respectable epidemiologist will actually state what percent of population is immune at the cur uh, currently. Uh, and the same is true with uh, herd immunity. We don't know what the, the threshold is to reach that. We do know a few things. We know that the threshold is higher in urban areas because infectious diseases tend to spread more in urban areas where they have more contact. So the level needed for herd immunity is going to be bigger, higher in urban areas compared to rural areas. But it also depends on who gets infected. If an older person who stays mostly at home is infected, that doesn't really contribute much to herd immunity. But if the traveling, traveling salesman or the pizza boy 
or the hairdresser, if they are immune, because they see a lot of people all the time. So if they are immune, they contribute a lot to herd immunity. So that means that if all those who spread it more, if, if they get immune, a much lower percentage is needed to reach herd immunity. But if it's the older people who mostly stay at home who get to be immune because maybe some caregiver is going from one to the other, infecting all of them, then that doesn't really help with herd immunity very much. Well, staying on this topic for a minute, when we look at the numbers coming out of Sweden right now, where it's almost as if COVID-19 is not even a factor at all in terms of deaths, hospitalizations, the ICUs are pretty much emptying out. We could say the same thing about New York. Uh, and a number of other places. And then where I live in Florida, we were part of the the Sunbelt spike, but we didn't lock down during that spike in Florida. They did close some bars in some jurisdictions, but really what happened is the bars pretended they were restaurants and kept opening. So really very, very little changed. And yet the spike ended. So something's going on here that at least to, a let's say, a, a layman like me, seems hard to explain if, if this virus were to behave the way we'd been told it would behave at the beginning about exponential growth and you have to take all these non-pharmaceutical interventions in order to stop it. It seems like almost no matter what we do, eventually in various jurisdictions, it subsides, whether we lock down or don't, no matter, if, if I look at different graphs of different jurisdictions and I look at case counts, deaths, hospitalizations, and I try to pick out which are the ones that lock down, which ones lock down earliest, Uh, When did they stop locking down? When did they institute a mask mandate? Did they institute a mask mandate? I can't tell the difference. It looks the same everywhere. Why is that? So if we take uh, Florida and New York City and Sweden, there is clearly a lot of immunity uh, in the population, for sure. Uh, And that's what's driving down the, the hospitalizations and the mortality. Because in all these cases, well, in Florida, they kept it open. So it's not going down because more countermeasures are put in. So that leaves that it's going down because the immunity in the community is increasing. Uh, And the same with Sweden. It has been going down and it's very close to zero now. And it's been doing that at the same time as the country was relaxing the, the restrictions. So it's clear that it's is because there's an increase in the immunity in the population. Uh, Now, the question is, is that immunity enough so that when you open up everything completely to normal, that you won't have another little little bump? That is impossible to know. But for sure, there's a lot of immunity in Florida, in New York City, as well as in Sweden. What numbers do you think we should be watching? There's been a lot of controversy about whether we should be tracking quote-unquote cases And some people say that these case numbers can be enormous and sometimes inflated because of the PCR testing problem. It's another matter. Should we be looking at hospitalizations, deaths, percent positive rate? There are all these numbers being thrown at us. What are the ones we should look at most closely? In terms of sort of the current situation, like uh, current awareness, I think that hospitalizations and mortality are the key measures. And of course, they come a little bit after cases, but the problem with looking at cases is that it depends so much on testing. So if you increase testing, you're going to increase cases. If you decrease testing, you're going to decrease cases. So it's very sensitive to that. Uh, So therefore, I think hospitalization and death are the thing of interest in the short term. In the long term, when we look at things, I think it's excess death. We have to compare what were the deaths this year versus the average of the last five years or so. And of course, adjusted for population changes. So basically mortality per population and also adjusting for age. So ultimately that is gonna be the the gold standard uh, way of uh, determining how um, the seriousness and the effects of this pandemic. Now, I don't don't know for sure that this is in uh, your area of expertise, but there was a story probably three to four weeks old now that came out of the New York Times about the sensitivity of the PCR testing and the cycle threshold being used. And the argument was it's so sensitive that it's giving people a positive result when they're not infectious and when they probably should be getting a negative result. And my question is, number one, do you think that is a problem? And number two, if that's a problem, does it have implications for the death count? Are people being 
assigned a cause of death of COVID because they got this positive result that they shouldn't have gotten? Or is that not a problem? Uh, I think it depends because testing is used for different purposes. So the most important purpose of testing is if somebody is sick and they have the COVID symptoms and they need treatment, the doctor needs to know if it's COVID or something else. So there you need a test that's very sensitive to and you, because you don't want the false negatives. Uh, so for those type of testing, you need to have sort of one threshold in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Uh, on the other hand, my view is that I mean, it's also important to test, for example, nursing home staff and nursing home visitors so that you protect the residents in the nursing homes. And there, I think you also want to be more safe than sorry. So you want to have a very sensitive test because the consequences are much more grave if you, uh, if somebody who actually is infected uh, see these older residents who are very much at high risk. Uh, versus uh, not letting uh, a staff member work for a few days or so on. So in those settings, you would want one threshold for the tests. On the other hand, if you go and test the general population, it's a big problem if you go and test and you have extremely sensitive tests and then you say they have COVID when in fact they might have had it some time ago and they are not infecting anybody else and they have no symptoms, uh, etc. But in those situations, actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I would take it one step further. Uh, in schools and universities, I don't think that it makes any public health sense to do testing. If a child is sick, send them home, whether they have COVID or something else, and uh, have them come back to school when they feel well. But don't start testing and then sending people home who are asymptomatic and then their friends, uh, sending their friends home and so on. Uh, school is important, so I think there's no public health reasons to do mass testing in schools and uh, colleges. And I, I wrote an op-ed about that a few weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal together with a colleague of mine from Stanford, uh, Dr. Jay Patasharya. Oh, I've seen a number of interviews that he's done, and I like him very much, again, as, as, just, as just a layman. So it's interesting that your position is very much not a one-size-fits-all, whether it comes to lockdowns or, or uh, the public health response, the, the testing we have to look at the individual situation. And testing college students makes less sense than testing people who are about to visit their elderly relatives. And that brings me back to the, the issue of trying to protect the elderly who are particularly vulnerable here. At the same time, I mean, I realize there's no easy solution to this and that there are sacrifices that need to be made. But at the same time, it seems that in some cases, the elderly are being subjected to such extreme isolation that it's a kind of death and I wonder, is there, is there some less blunt instrument that we can use that would still allow them to have a little bit more human contact than a lot of them have had? Yeah, so that's a very uh, important issue and a very sad issue for many older people. And one thing is that the longer we drag this out, so the longer we sort of prevent younger people to get the disease and build up the herd immunity, which they can do with, with very minimal risk to themselves, the longer we drag that out, the longer the older people are going to have to self-isolate. And there's two problems with that. One is that's very difficult from a psychological and social perspective to do that for month after month after month. You can do it for two or three months, maybe, or a little bit longer, but to do it for, for a whole year or more, uh, that's brutal. And the other thing is it's harder to protect the older people if you drag it on because they need to go to the dentist or, or so on at some point. So uh, the longer you sort of drag this out, the harder it, it will be to protect uh, the elderly and for them to protect themselves. Uh, so that's one point. The other thing is that I think there are some ways to do it so that it is less severe uh, in terms of a social impact. For example, to do more, the more frequent testing of nursing home staff and visitors, that would actually allow more visits to the nursing home. So, so that's something that both protects them and allows them to have more uh, social life and social visitors. Also, I think maybe older people shouldn't go to the supermarket themselves because uh, uh, that's the risky, but they can be more liberal with in terms of uh, seeing uh, family and friends, close friends. One of the reasons, another reason that's been cited as to why your approach is supposed to be 
unwise is that they say, although it's true that young people aren't generally dying from it, there is what some people have have nicknamed long haul COVID, that we don't know what the long term results could be. And we have some initial evidence, they say, that even if in the short run there are not serious health problems, it does seem to harm people in the long run, they say. And so we can't just say, kids, go live your lives because we could be inadvertently doing damage to them. Do you have an opinion on that? Well, first of all, we are, we don't know anything about the long-term effects beyond six months for obvious reasons, because nobody has had it for that long. So that's an unknown question mark. So uh, nobody knows. When it comes to uh, a more short term, like uh, two, three, four month uh, adverse effects of having infection, what I've been told from by my physician colleagues is that it happens, but it doesn't seem to happen any more than from other infections like diseases like the influenza. So I think we have to treat it similarly to uh, influenza, which has similar long-term side effects sometimes. Folks, let me take just a brief minute to tell you about the way I solve a major problem that we all have. Because we're all intellectuals, we have a pile of books we want to read, we have no idea how we're going to get through all of them. And the answer is Blinkist. It's unique and powerful, works on your phone, your tablet, your web browser. It gives you the best key takeaways, the need-to-know information from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories. Blinkist condenses them down into blinks, which you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. And I like Blinkist because after that 15-minute blink, I know whether or not the full-length audiobook is really a good use of my time. I use Blinkist when I'm driving around in the car, which would otherwise be dead time, and I'm absorbing book after book while I drive. I've listened to these Blinks, and I highly recommend you check them out. Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker and The Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off audiobooks, yours to keep forever. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com woods to get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com woods. I'm curious about, because uh, you've written about the collateral damage caused by lockdowns. And and it's not necessary to be a physician or to be a scientist even to see what the collateral damage of lockdowns are. Just use common sense and you can see that interruption of supply chains can, you know, can lead to problems of delivery of food and other necessities or, or more than that, there are delays in necessary health procedures that people needed to have. And now we're reading that in the New York Times that over the next five years, maybe another over and above the normal number, another 1.4 million tuberculosis deaths. The collateral damage seems absolutely overwhelming and just gets worse and worse. But what public policy then, if you, if you don't favor lockdowns, do you favor any type of invasive public policy to, to try to slow or stop this? Well, I think the collateral damage done by the uh, lockdown is huge. But a lot of it is not short-term, but long-term. For example, the cancer screenings has gone down. And the diagnosis, the number of cancer diagnoses that we have are down. And it's not because people don't get cancer anymore. It's because they're not detected, because less screening and less primary care. So that's a huge concern. But those are not things that we're going to see in the tallies of the mortality right now, because it's not that you're going to die this year because you don't get the cancer screening. Instead, you will maybe die three or four years from now instead of 10 to 20 years from now. And there are similar thing with cardiovascular diseases. The childhood immunizations has plummeted. So that's the concern because maybe we will have outbreaks of childhood diseases now. And there's more house evictions, and house evictions are not good for public health in addition to all the other bad things they have with them. So uh, the collateral damage is, is, uh, is big, and it obviously hurts uh, the working class the most because they already have a worse public health uh, situation. So, so it's, it's, that's a big concern of mine and should be a concern for everybody. So what would you have done differently? Well, I think if we had done the age-specific approach, then uh, uh, we would not have had these uh, big collateral damages anymore. And we would have be able to go back to normal life more quickly. 
So there would have been some interruptions, especially among the elderly, but there wouldn't be have to be any interruptions about childhood immunizations, for example, because children should still go to the doctors as uh, as normally, uh, and people shouldn't be afraid to go to the hospitals if they uh, feel uh, sick in any way. So uh, by having an age-targeted approach, we will not drag on the pandemic for as long. We will protect the high-risk elderly so that we have fewer deaths by the end of this, and we will not interrupt the society as much, so we will have less collateral damage. I have two more questions before I let you go. The first one is a bit of a third rail, and I would not hold it against you if you did not want to answer this question, but I feel compelled to ask you, what is your opinion of Dr. Fauci? Dr. Fauci is an immunologist and a very eminent immunologist. So if you have questions about immunology, then I think he is a very good person to ask those questions. And you shouldn't really ask me about them because I don't know more than you would be able to figure out by spending a week studying the subject. So on those subjects, you should definitely listen to Dr. Fauci. If you're interested in uh, issues of public health, then uh, I'm very happy to talk about those things because that's sort of my area of expertise. But immunology, I couldn't talk about. Well, I think what's happened in at least at least in the U.S., is that because Dr. Fauci has gone beyond the area of his expertise, clearly in recommending that this, you know, let's say football not start, you know, I, I don't even remember the sorts of things he's called for, but, but, you know, whether or not we should have schools, whether or not we should do this and that, is that people have said, well, he's the expert, and so if you think we should open up this or that institution, then you're just defying the experts. And I, I feel like on things like that, he's no more of an authority than anybody else would be. Because yes, he might know something about this particular virus, but he can't tell me that this particular virus is the only priority I'm allowed to have in life. There are people in the developing world who are suffering tremendously. I just talked to somebody who lived in Malawi for three years. They tried to lock down in Malawi. The people rose up and the government had to relent. But there are places like Sierra Leone where there's almost no trace of the virus. And but because their one priority is COVID-19, they've devastated people who are living hand to mouth. So I don't think it's, I think it's an abuse of his authority that he has to give the impression that in addition to immunology, he also knows about whether you should stay in your house and whether you should have this institution open or not, because it's making people think that the experts have told me that the thing to do is to cut off all things that give my children joy and keep in my house. That that that's done a lot of damage, in my opinion. So infectious diseases are very complicated things. So there's nobody who is the expert on all aspects of COVID or all aspects of infectious diseases. So there is sort of the immunology and virology, people who know about viruses, and uh, that's critical knowledge uh, to, for example, develop a vaccine. So there are those who are expert on that area. And they are doing very, very important work to uh, try to get a vaccine as quickly as possible. Uh, Then there's like a second area, which is uh, how you treat patients. The doctors who are treating them uh, at the hospitals, that's a very different set of expertise you need for that. And then the third area is the public health aspects of how uh, how do the infections spread in the community and how do you mitigate that as best as possible to minimize the overall burden of this pandemic on the population as a whole. So those are three very different areas of, uh, uh, of infectious diseases, and nobody is an expert in all three areas. And in the third area, we cannot only think about the COVID. We also have to think about whatever countermeasures we do, what effects do they have on public health in general, because we have to see it not short-term, but long-term, and not a single disease, but all aspects of public health, and not an individual patient, but the population as a whole. So uh, those are three very different things. Well, my last question involves something that you've said on your Twitter feed, which I enjoy very much. I'm deeply grateful for your Twitter feed. (laughs) And you were, sometimes people will say to you that your opinion is some outlying, minority, heterodox, dissident opinion. And your response has been, no, within my field, most of us think this way, that we should have an age-specific policy on dealing with COVID. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, so my colleagues who are infectious disease epidemiologists that I talk to, most of us think that the age-targeted approach uh, is, uh, is the right strategy. That includes, for example, uh, Professor Sunata Gupta at Oxford University, who in my view is the preeminent infectious disease epidemiologist in the world. Uh, it includes Stefan Baral at Johns Hopkins University. It includes Rebecca Chandler, who is an uh, American infectious, infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist who actually lives in Sweden. So she has sort of, sort of both the Swedish and the U.S. perspective on things. And many more, including some who don't want to speak up in public because they have concerns about it. But we talk sort of privately. So it's not, it's not all infectious disease technologists who agree with this, but there are certainly uh, very many and the most of the people that I talk to. But uh, among uh, scientists in general, outside of this specific field, uh, at least among those that are vocal, I think uh, most of them have a different opinion. Is As we wrap up, for ordinary laymen without medical or public health background who nevertheless want to stay informed, and they want the good news and the bad news, but they, they just don't want hysteria, they, they don't want panic, they, they just want a rational overview of what's really happening and what we're learning and so on. Are there sources that we can consult, news outlets, scientific ones, or are there ones that, that you rely on that a layman could use? Because I think a lot of people feel a bit adrift when it comes to staying informed. I think one of the best sources are the various interviews and uh, lectures given by uh, Dr. Sunetta Gupta. I think they are very, uh, she knows what she's talking about and they are very thoughtful and uh, she's able to explain things to a lay audience, but still still talking about it sort of in a, not without dumbing it down. So still talking about the key concepts of infectious disease epidemiology. So I would encourage that both the inter- written interviews as well as the YouTube video interviews as well as YouTube videos of her talks. Those I would recommend very highly. I found out about her because of you and I've started to watch some of her videos and I agree completely with what you just said. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll link to some of her material. I'll link to some of the things that you've written as well at tomwoods.com slash 1741 for episode number 1741. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time today and Martin and thank you very much and please keep doing what you're doing because the world needs it. We'll do so and thank you so much Tom for having me on your show. I really appreciate that. All right everybody, that is our episode for today. Make sure you pick up my free ebook Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. You can pick that up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. If you're in the United States, you can get it by texting the word lockdown to the number 33444. Go enjoy that and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.